Hello, everybody. My name is Jeffrey Savis, and I'm coming to you from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Northwestern. I would like to thank Kay Opperman and Ryan Baumgarten for the opportunity to tell you about some of um, my lab's research. The title of my talk, Derailed Protein Turnover in the Aged Mammalian Brain. So just a disclosure, uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific and its affiliates are not endorsing or recommending the use or application of Thermo Fisher Scientific products presented in my talk. Okay. Aging is a complex process, which is hard to tie to one specific malfunction or dysregulated process and has been associated with cellular senescence, mitochondrial dysfunction, stem cell exhaustion, and a number of other processes. We are most interested in the evidence suggesting that aging is driven by the loss of proteostasis. That is the protein mechanisms underlying protein folding and protein turnover. What is clear is that folded proteins are subject to insults in the form of heat shock, protein folding stress, oxidative stress. And as a consequence, these misfolded proteins are subjected to degradation in the form of autophagy, proteasomal degradation, or protein refolding. Furthermore, misfolded proteins can aggregate and contribute to aging, as I mentioned. In biological systems, nearly all proteins are replenished through alternating waves of protein synthesis and protein degradation. And protein damage, as I just mentioned, is primarily um, handled by cells and tissues by removing of the damaged proteins. However, it's also well appreciated that during aging and after insults, damaged proteins accumulate and persist for long periods of time. And the consequence of these accumulated misfolded damages is that they impair cellular function and they can also contribute to organellular um, dysregulation. And this facet can contribute to cellular um, aging as well as tissue and organ associated age dysfunction. In general, the vast majority of proteins are turned over quickly and we call these short-lived proteins, which have lifetimes ranging from hours to days. However, we and others have identified long-lived proteins, which persist for months or even years. Until recently, the vast majority of studies aimed to identify long-lived proteins have relied on amino acid racemation and radioisotopic pulse labeling. However, we recently developed a stable isotope metabolic pulse chase labeling with mass spectrometry based proteomic workflow to identify and characterize long lived proteins. In our analysis workflow, we start by metabolically labeling mice or rats. And we do this by restricting their diet to either highly enriched, heavy lysine chow or nitrogen-15 enriched spirulina-based chow, and then providing that heavy chow to rodents as their sole source of amino acids or nitrogen. And in doing this, um, we essentially over weeks and months can generate animals in a single generation that are greater than 95% heavy labeled. We've also performed these experiments in two generational paradigms by which we start with a female rodent. We restrict her diet for 10 to 12 weeks with the heavy chow. This labeling occurs prior to, to breeding. And then the animals kept on the heavy chow during the, the pregnancy. The pups are born and they nurse from mom who's still on the heavy chow and results in pups that are about 85% nitrogen 15. And then if we feed that second generation animal for up to 21 or 30 days in mice or 42 days in rats, we can obtain animals that are greater than 95% heavy labeled. And really here we're limited only by the 
uh, isotopic enrichment of the chow. And what this affords us is that after isolating proteins, digesting the peptides and analyzing them by LCM SMS, we can actually identify and quantitate the relative abundance of the new and old proteins in the same mass spectra. So the heavy light isotopically labeled peptides co-elute from our chromatography system simultaneously. And then we can measure um, the elution profiles of these heavy light isotopic pairs. And then by performing MS1-based um, reconstructive chromatograms, we can determine the relative abundance of the new and old versions of the peptides. So we set up these, these experiments in a couple different ways. And just to give you a bit of background on how we do this, one paradigm is something that is referred to as continuous metabolic stable isotopic labeling. So here we have a, a cohort of animals, and essentially the the animals are born or they start unlabeled. They're just wild type animals on regular chow. And then at a specific time point, we switch their chow to the heavy isotopically enriched chow. And then this is a pulse for different periods of time. And that's shown here with the different red bars for the heavy food. And essentially the label incorporation, the, the, the rate and degree of incorporation provides some information on the protein's um, stability. In this strategy, the advantages are that it's less time consuming. The amount of isotop isotopes used is, is substantially less than a two-generational experiment. And this is particularly well-suited for short-lived proteins that are going to be synthesized and turned over completely during the labeling period. Um, and this is actually a good approach for that's well suited for determining protein turnover. That is the relationship between protein synthesis and degradation. However, on the limitations of this type of metabolic labeling to study protein lifetimes, um, it requires modeling. It's really not well suited for long-lived proteins that persist longer than the labeling period. And it's very challenging to use this approach to untangle um, new protein production versus impaired degradation. And in general, we, we like using this to study global protein turnover or to characterize um, proteins that are acutely regulated, uh, say, with a, a, a drug treatment or some acute stimuli. Um, and this is, is very well suited, again, for determining relative dynamic differences in protein turnover. Alternatively, in a classic pulse chase metabolic stable isotope labeling experiment, we again start with animals that are unlabeled, and then we metabolically label them really to completion. So this is commonly what we, we do with the two-generational experiment, where we're going to try to label almost all the proteins fully with the heavy isotope. And then we sacrifice the animals at different times, either time zero, um, time, time one week or one month. Uh, and then two months or six months. Um, and then essentially there's this, this is the chase period by which we're going to introduce the the normal isotopic um, unenriched chow. And then by studying and quantifying the ratio of the newly synthesized unlabeled and the old heavy proteins persisting, we can investigate protein turnover in this way. Uh, yes. And this is well suited for long lived proteins. Uh, this is essentially the, the protocol we use to identify extremely long-lived proteins. And this is really well suited for studying degradation kinetics. Um, it typically does not require modeling. Um, and we don't really need necessarily to know the initial isotopic um, concentration because we analyze that at our time zero time point and then analyze our data relative to the time zero with no chase. On the weak side, this is a very long-term experiment that in mice or rats takes several years. It also requires a large quantity of isotopes. Uh, it's not particularly well-suited for proteins that are rapidly turned over. Um, and really, the, the timing of the labeling and chase is not particularly flexible if you want to overlap that with a specific um, stimuli perturbation or uh, development of pathology. And again, we like this to study long-lived proteins, to identify proteins that have impaired turnover due to aggregation or to investigate degradation dynamics. So next, I'm just going to summarize a few um, of our interesting um, observations that we've made using these approaches. And so first, we found that very few proteins have lifetimes that are greater than four months. And here I'm showing you a plot with the number of long-lived proteins on the y-axis and the total number of proteins um, quantified on the x-axis. 
And then each of these dots is actually a tissue type um, or organ, which we analyzed. So you can see that in the warm yellow, orange, and red colors, we have brain different brain regions, which have um, essentially been dissected from the rodents. And these brain regions are enriched with many long-lived cells, that is, post-mitotic cells do, that do not divide, such as neurons or oligodendrocytes. Um, and then we also have tissues like the heart, which also has long post-mitotic long-lived cells. And these tissues, the brain and the heart, have relatively uh, large numbers of long-lived proteins. And other examples of tissues with long-lived proteins would be um, the eye or the ear. Um, and in converse, when we look at tissues like the spleen, the pancreas, the liver, the lung, or blood, we do not identify many long-lived proteins at all. So there's some relationship that we're exploring between the long-term persistence of cells and then how these cells actually maintain these long-lived proteins. We've also performed a variety of biochemical um, fractionations, organellular isolations. And what we, we found is that long, these extremely long-lived proteins are actually present in several different organelles. The nucleus is one um, organelle, which contains a large number of long-lived proteins. Um, we also have some evidence that there are long-lived proteins um, in the mitochondria. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. One of the longest lived proteins we've identified thus far is the specialized um, replication dependent histone, histone 3.1. So this protein shown here was almost entirely nitrogen 15 in our study. So essentially it's almost all long lived. And this just shows the um, amount, the percent of long lived that is N15 versus um, time. So this is in the X axis in months. So you can see here um, zero, three, six, 12 months. And the essentially the, the level of the nitrogen 15 containing histone 3.1 is really greater than 95%. So essentially this suggests that when, when we isolate post mitotic neuronal nuclei from the metabolically pulse chased animals and then do our LCMS, we have evidence that this histone 3.1 that was de that was detected does not turn over after it's being deposited onto the chromatin. And we have an idea for how this may work. We, we think that histone 3.1 is gonna be chromatin loaded uh, when, this, when the neuronal precursor exits the cell cycle. This protein is gonna remain bound to the chromatin during the, the rest of the cell cycle, the G2, mitosis G1. And then when that neuron exits the cell cycle or that NPC and then differentiates the neuron, it's still essentially histone 3.1 loaded. And then that as that cell persists, that um, histone 3.1 is present. And then as another cell in the um, differentiation pathway is born, it again goes through the S phase, it's gonna be loaded again with histone 3.1 and the same pattern is going to continue. Another um, interesting observation that we made in our early studies was that the core of the nuclear pore complex, that is the multi-protein um, elaborate structure that separates the cytosol from the nucleus, um, the core of the nuclear pore complex, only the core in post-mitotic neurons persist together as a unit for months. And this was unexpected because prior to this, the general thought was that protein complexes are degraded together as a single unity with all the proteins at present being turned over at the same time. So this was surprising because here we could show that the three proteins involved, three proteins consisting of the NUP107160 protein complex actually persist together um, in similar uh, manners across three, six, nine, and even 12 months. And this is shown here for NUP60, NUP107, and NUP96. Um, this is another core complex, the NUP205 complex. And again, you can see NUP205, NUP155, and NUP93 are actually maintained together. So altogether suggesting that these core complexes shown here in uh, light blue or in pink, these protein complexes either are recycled together uh, as a subcomplex or those core complexes provide some structural scaffold-like seed to the replacement um, of the other peripherally associated nuclear pore nut proteins. 
In the mitochondria, I showed you we had this initial observation that there were some long-lived mitochondria proteins. And um, here I'm going to tell you about how we um, investigated two possibilities. So one possibility is that these long-lived mitochondrial proteins are actually dispersed in the mitochondrial network, just salt and peppered a little bit of each protein in different mitochondria, or these proteins are actually long-lived in the same mitochondria. And to do that, we isolated uh, N15 um, continuously labeled heart. And uh, then we purified the mitochondria using antibodies. And then we subjected the mitochondria to DSSO chemical cross-linking. And then we performed um, bottom-up proteomic analysis. So we extracted the proteins, digested them to peptides, and then analyzed them by LCMS. So in this way, the cross-linked peptides would be detected in the MS1 scan of the mass spec would either be a cross-linked N14 and 14 peptide, a cross-linked N14 and 15 peptide, or an N15 and 15 cross-linked peptide. And in this way, we were able to investigate in the, the, the same scan if these proteins are actually present in close proximity, i.e. meaning new, 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 old, or new, old protein-protein um, interactions. So then we used the Thermo's um, very powerful um, method by which we could actually program our mass spec to identify these asymmetrical pairs indicative of the fragmentation of a crosslink peptide in the MS2. And then when the presence of that asymmetrical crosslink was pair was present in the MS2, we programmed the instrument to actually trigger an MS to the three. And then we could actually identify the two peptides. And again, in this way, we could get old, old, new, new, or mixed, new, old um, crosslink peptides. So this is just a silver stain gel showing that um, we could actually get good crosslinking with DSSO. Um, here we've mapped the number of crosslinks um, across the different proteins, just in, as this um, ball and stick plot shows. Um, and then when we looked at the number of crosslinks, as I think many of you might appreciate, a lot of these crosslinks are actually um, self uh, intralinks, that is self non-overlapping peptides or self overlapping peptides. However, we did identify here more than 100 interlinks, so crosslinks between two different um, proteins. And what we were excited to see was that the vast majority of the crosslinks, you can see here greater than 90%, were between new, new proteins or old, old. And we found only a small fraction of mixed crosslinks between new and old. So then we went on and actually we we, we modeled these crosslinks onto known PDB structures. This is ATP synthase of, of um, mitochondria. And you can see here the crosslinks are actually indicated by these little blue um, or gold bars. And the vast majority of the crosslinks actually, you can see, are actually within different parts of the same complex. So within the same complex, the new, new, or old, old crosslinks actually are indicative of proteins that are in the same complex. Um, so there's there's very limited mixing at the protein level but within the complex. However, we did see mixed crosslinks between new and old, suggesting that the complexes, um, in contrast, actually are assembled when you have new and old complexes in close proximity. Altogether suggesting that indeed the long-lived mitochondria proteins seem to be present in the same mitochondria rather than randomly distributed. Okay, now on to the main story of the talk. So um, the, this, these studies were um, satisfying to us and we were happy with our discoveries. But then what we wanted to do here is to actually move one step further and to actually get it, instead of just having a snapshot of different time points, but to actually look at protein turnover um, dynamics across the aging continuum. And we thought that by looking at the relative changes in um, protein turnover across aging, we may be able to understand some new aspects about what happens during aging. So the, 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 the idea would be that it, one possibility is that protein turnover actually just declines with age in a linear manner. Or it may be that protein turnover actually fluctuates um, randomly or in specific patterns during aging. And this is essentially what we set out to figure out. So to do this, we obtained a cohort of mice that were either 12 months, 
15 months, 18 months, 21 months, or 24 months of age. And just to give you a sense of scale, a mature adult mouse is about three to six months of age. Um, a middle-aged mouse is about 10 to 14. So this is like our 12 and 15. These are middle-aged mice. And then the 18, 21, and 24 age mice are old. And about 50% of mice um, will have died due to age-associated uh, decline by 28 months. And so then what we did is we actually, we restricted these animals' diets to the heavy nitrogen 15 enriched chow. Um, that actually has the N15 labeled spirulina. So this was actually administered as the sole nitrogen source to the animal from either nine to 12 months, 12 to 15 months, 15 to 18 months, 18 to 21 or 21 to 24. And the thinking here was that um, the proteins we'd identified previously, these long lived proteins, we believe that those are the proteins that are more likely to uh, accumulate age associated damage to misfold or aggregate. Therefore, by having this three month time frame, we were able to concentrate our signals um, on the proteins that persist for long periods of time rather than proteins that are rapidly turned over. So first, I'm just gonna show you that when we isolate the cortex, the part of the brain, the heart, um, or the liver, we, we as expected, see that first, um, the, the tissues with long-lived cells have longer-lived proteins. So here, this is a, just a raw MS1 peak for a um, malate dehydrogenase, a, a mitochondrial protein. And you can see the N14, which is going to be the old protein here, right? And the N15 proteins were the proteins that were synthesized during that three-month time frame. And you can see here, we can detect both the new and old um, proteins at pretty substantial levels um, across 12, 15, 18, 21, and 24 months uh, of age in um, the brain. And similarly, but to a lesser degree in the heart. So again, you can see that we could detect um, nice isotopic envelopes at the MS1 level for either, again, the 12, 15, 18, 21, or 24 month time point. And conversely, when we look in the liver, an organ with um, very few, if rather no long-lived cells, um, we see essentially 100% N15 newly synthesized peptides. So there's no old proteins corresponding to this mitochondria um, signal here. So just to, to take this one step further, first we look at the number of, of protein identifications based on the N15 ID. So these are the proteins that were synthesized during that labeling period. And you can see we're at around 2,000 proteins in the brain, about 1,200 in the heart, and over 2,000 um, in the liver. And this is pretty similar uh, numbers across the different aging time points. However, if we look at the N14 proteins, the proteins that must have been synthesized prior to that labeling period, um, you can see that there's far fewer proteins. So here we're in this hundreds range. So in the brain, we had about 200 proteins um, across the different time points, about 100 in the heart, and very few in the liver, most of which were just histones. And then if we plot the fractional abundance, so the fractional abundance is our metric of protein turnover. So here we have essentially N14. So that's going to be our old protein over the amount of old plus new. And you can see here as um, anticipated, the liver has essentially very low fractional abundance. But that's because turnover is very high. So low fractional abundance, high turnover. And that's going to be important to understand the rest of the talk. And then again, you can see that in both the cortex or in the heart, however, there is a relatively high fractional abundance of the old proteins. It's about 10% for the, the brain and about 5% for the heart. And this is just shows the trajectory of that protein turnover across the ages. So it looks like the heart essentially seems to go down a little bit and the brain stays flat, maybe goes up a little bit. Um, in terms of fractional abundance. Okay, next, we coupled this to TMT. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to examine the same peptides, both heavy and light forms across the different ages. So we set up two 10 plexes for each sex, and we have four biological replicates for each condition. So you can see that's cartooned here. Um, and the way that we run this is essentially we're going to do our 
standard LCMS to the third SPS multi natch uh, workflow, which we we really come to love. And um, here we're actually going to either identify the N14 or N15, that is the fully N14 or fully N15 labeled peptide in the MS2, and then we're going to liberate those reporter ions in the MS3, and we're going to get our um, turnover measurements from the TMT quantification. And again, this is going to be um, quantified based on the fractional abundance, that is the old over new plus old, and that's our metric for turnover. And again, if it's a if we have a high fractional abundance, that means there is going to be a slow turnover. So first, just some quality control metrics. So here you can see um, we're just graphing the N15 TMT reporter ions or the TMT reporter ions from the N15 proteins, rather, both in the male and female across the two different sexes and the five different ages. And in general, as you'd expect on a log two plot, we have very similar um, numbers. This just shows our the reproducibility in terms of our labeling efficiency. So we can get pretty consistent labeling across um, our different ages, um, just looking at the summed TMT channel intensity. And then next, I want to show you how many proteins we quantify in these experiments. So on the we have male and female here. And we have the N14 identifications as this little pizza piece of pie. And then the larger circle is actually the N15. So we're at like 600, uh, 400 to 600 old, three month old proteins here. And um, again, this is all in the brain. And then we have like five to 8,000 newly synthesized protein in the N14 channel, N15 channel, sorry. And then this just shows now for these old N14 proteins about 375 were identified in both the males or females. Okay, so the first thing we looked at um, was that if we look at the protein turnover in the males, and we, we plot it here, I hope what you can see is that when we consider this um, protein turnover is actually um, pretty okay at 12, 15, and 18 months, but it starts to show this decline towards 21 and 24 months of age. Conversely, in the females, we find that the protein turnover starts um, fairly consistent up until 18 um, months of age, at which time the protein turnover actually is going up. Um, and this is our first um, observation that it appears that protein turnover in the male and female brains, maybe not surprisingly, does appear to be um, somewhat dissimilar. So then we went on and replotted this on heat maps. And then here you can see the males and females with the dark colors having slow protein turnover and the warm colors having higher protein turnover and the time points being the columns and our proteins being the rows. And we, we clustered these, these data sets. Um, and you can see here, this is cluster one, cluster two, cluster three, cluster four, cluster five in the males and cluster one and cluster two in the females. And then we can make these plots here. Um, and you can see that um, in general, in, in cluster one, essentially, um, this is going to be the inverse. You can see that protein turnover starts um, fairly high. But as we get towards this 21 um, months of age, the protein turnover starts to decline. Um, and then in the females, we had only two clusters one of which um, had high protein turnover that turned to low and one that basically stayed pretty flat and then protein turnover actually increased with, with age. Okay, so what do these, these clusters do? We took each one of the clusters, took the proteins from that group, subjected it to very traditional gene ontology enrichment analysis. And then we made these, these plots here where we have the geo terms and then the number of proteins in each um, term as the size of the, the dot and then the color as our FDR. And I think the mo most importantly, what, what we were excited to see here is we found a strong synapse uh, signal both in the C1 and C3. And essentially both of those um, have, they start with essentially like a slow turnover and then have a burst of, of turnover as, as, the, as they age. Um, we also found a strong mitochondrial signal in this, this cluster three, which um, 
essentially had a high uh, FA value to start and the FA value um, decreased. We also found signals for myelin sheath, which is also well known to be enriched with proteins with long lifetime, such as myelin basic protein. And that again was in cluster three for the males. Conversely, in the females, we had these just these two different um, clusters. And in cluster one, again, we have a, essentially protein turnover, which um, starts to be uh, quite high. And then essentially the protein turnover um, becomes slower. And then we have, again, a cluster two where protein turnover is quite normal. And we actually see that um, as the FA value is going to get lower later in age, it's indicative of uh, protein turnover being elevated. And again, when we subject these clusters to gene ontology enrichment analysis, we found a signal for synapse, um, mitochondria, and in myelin sheath for cluster one. So then um, with this information in hand, we, we then explored uh, the possibility that um, many long-lived damaged proteins that have impaired turnover may actually be accumulating in the insoluble material of the brain. So we isolated the insoluble fraction. This is the SDS insoluble um, material that we could isolate from our biochemical preps. Same pulse chase animals, um, and then you, you could actually we could look at the the, the protein turnover here, and you can see um, that in general um, across the ages there was a pretty similar degree of protein turnover, which was generally slow for these proteins, which is not entirely surprising because they're probably misfolded or aggregated. And then when we we plotted the turnover rates, we saw two patterns, a group of proteins, which we call steady. These essentially are proteins which did not have age-dependent differences in their protein turnover. And these are in blue. Many of these are proteins that are associated with chromatin or myelin, which actually makes sense. However, we did find some dynamic proteins that actually have changes in their protein turnover in an age-dependent manner. And we were, again, excited to see terms like axon and synapse in this um, group of proteins. Pretty similar in the females, we again find two different groups of proteins which are misfolded that have um, dissimilar patterns of protein turnover. We have the steady insoluble proteins that have uh, really flat protein turnover uh, across aging in blue, nucleosome, chromatin, collagen. Um, but again, interestingly, in the more dynamic age-dependent changed uh, protein turnover in the insoluble fraction, we see that many of these proteins are actually associated with the synapse. So next, we actually took um, the insoluble proteins, and we wanted to explore the possibility that these proteins actually may be accumulating either in a ubiquinated or an ununiquinated um, misfolded manner. That is, are they being targeted for degradation and not being able to be degraded or are they just not being targeted? And interestingly, so we we, we, we searched the proteins for the indicative digli remnant on the, the, the Ks, the lysines after trypsin digestion. And then again, we use our um, N14, N15 measurements to look at the turnover of, the, of these proteins. And we find that uh, essentially some of these proteins um, showed a, a decline in turnover at around the 21 month of age um, grouped animals. Then we look at the identity of these proteins in aggregate, and we find that many of these um, ubiquinated proteins in the insoluble fraction are actually associated with synapses. So with, with this information in hand, we thought, okay, so it looks like these proteins are being targeted for degradation and they're in, in the insoluble fraction, but they're not being degraded. So to explore that possibility, we thought there may be something going on with the proteasome. So next we isolated the, the proteasome using affinity capture from the same metabolically pulse chase labeled brains. And um, this just shows our enrichment of the, the the proteasome with a Western blot for PS, uh, PSMC5 shown here. And we first looked at the, the turnover of the actual proteins in the proteasome that we're pulling down and the proteasome associated um, proteins. And what, what we found was that the essentially the, the protein turnover is actually slowing. That is the, 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 the age of the proteasome is actually, these proteins are older 
at older ages. So the turnover is actually of the protein degradation machinery is also impaired at old ages. We, 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 and we were excited by this possibility. And so first we looked to see, does the level of the proteasome change across aging? And we did not find any evidence for that. Then we, we went on to explore the possibility that either the 19S or 20S proteasome activity may be altered um, during during aging. And what we were um, surprised to see that we see that the, the proteasome seems to be most enzymatically active or it's the healthiest at around this 18 months age shown here in this plot. But then when we look at the turnover of the, the actual proteasome subunits, interestingly, what we found was we found a strong correlation between the the turnover, that is that at 18 months, at the, the time point where the activity was the highest, we also find the highest level of newly synthesized, that is more frequently turned over proteasome subunits, suggesting that the activity of the proteasome at least correlates with the age of the subunits. And to confirm that, we actually extracted the N4, sorry, N15 proteins, that is the newly synthesized proteasome subunits, which were synthesized during that metabolic labeling period. And if we compare this at the 18 months, you can see that there's a lot of these catalytic subunits that have higher abundance of the newly synthesized versions of the proteins. Well, at 24 months, there's less abundance. There's less new proteins together suggesting um, that the age of the proteasome may play a key role in determining not only the fidelity of the, of the proteasome, but also the fidelity of the entire proteome. And that now we're actually going on to, to test some of these observations by pharmacologically inhibiting the, the proteasome to see if we can recapitulate these um, observations at younger ages. So just to summarize, the brain, pro we, I told you today that the, the brain proteome um, experiences very dynamic protein turnover during aging. I also told you that um, there were cellular component and sex specific differences during aging. I also provided evidence that protein misfolding of distinct protein pools contributes to um, dissimilar turnover trends in the brain proteome. Um, and I also presented some evidence that proteasome activity uh, um, in brain extracts correlates with the, the turnover of the catalytic subunits. And just to thank the people in my lab who did the work, this was a project led by a fantastic graduate student, Nalini Rao, and close support by a, a top postdoctoral fellow, uh, Arun Udapade, as well as um, additional support from Ava Bamba-Varzak, another postdoc in the lab. I'd also like to thank the NIH for these training awards, as well as these um R21 and R01 awards that actually paid for these experiments. And this is just a lab picture from my backyard here in Chicago. And I'd also like to thank all of you for taking the time to listen to this. And um, yeah, I really um, wanna also uh, give a big thanks to Thermo for the fantastic opportunity to work with TMT uh, tags in combination with our metabolic labeling. Thank you.